Dr. Moibo gave me a very straightforward assignment uh, to reflect on strategic leadership uh, in the security sector in Africa. Uh, this is a straightforward uh, but very, very complicated task because as we look at Africa, uh, we, we see that the continent is entering a very crucial period uh, of its post-colonial trajectory. Uh, the independence uh, decade was back in the 1960s. Uh, many of our countries gained independence. So we are on that trajectory for about 60 years now. But when we look at the continent, what we see is that the promise of independence has not been fully realized. Instead, we see a juxtaposition of two pictures, two images, two realities. On one hand, we see an Africa that is incredibly rich, rich in just about everything. It's an incredible rich land of opportunity. And if I were to list the opportunities, I would stay here for the whole afternoon because uh, the opportunities are many. The richness is, uh, is much. The endowment uh, is quite impressive. In listing the opportunities in Africa, I usually start with the youth, the youth. Very young population. You know, you go to Africa, you know, you, 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 you are embraced by the energy, by the vibrancy of a very young uh, population. Resources, natural resources. We can talk about human resources, but we can also talk about natural resources. Each and every one of the countries represented here is incredibly wealthy in terms of natural resources. You want, you want diamonds, you find there. You want oil, is there. You want all sorts of minerals, strategic minerals, they're there. Water. Some people say that some of the wars in the future will be fought over water, the abundance of water in Africa is huge. Land, land itself, arable land to feed uh, a growing population around the world is there. If you look at the percentage of arable land that is still not utilized is still not in use, the, the, the greatest percentage uh, is in Africa. You know, uh, if you talk in terms of the environment, uh, look at the Congo, the Congo Basin, and so on. Uh, my sister from, uh, uh, from uh, Ghana the other day was talking about maritime, shipping, and so on the opportunities are immense. So that's on one frame. But then we go to the other frame. We see that the continent is full of challenges. It's full of challenges. At the very top of my list of challenges is governance. Governance. Governance challenge is reflected, for example, I started on the opportunity side, on the opportunity column, on that frame with the youth. You go to this other frame, you also start with the youth, but the youth are unemployed. The youth have no jobs. 
the youth have no jobs. In most countries, in many of our countries in Africa, many of the youth that are unemployed are actually well-educated. Well-educated. Go to Senegal. Go to Senegal, for example. There are highly, highly educated young people. Do they have jobs? Very closely related to the issue of governance deficit uh, is the delivery of public goods. I can ask each and every one of you to tell me one or two exceptions. I know Mauritius may say, yeah, yeah, we deliver public goods well. Right? Maybe there's another exception of Botswana. Where's Botswana? Botswana may say, oh, we deliver public goods well. Seychelles and so on and so forth. But the vast majority, if we are going to be honest with ourselves, how many countries are able to deliver public goods to the citizens? And here I'm talking about, talked about education. We talk about housing, health care, roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who, uh, how many countries on the continent? You know, Cabo Verde is sitting there. Cabo Verde is doing things well. Cabo Verde is doing things well. For it's one of the very few countries in Africa that, when you look at the list of natural resources. Oil, Cabo Verde doesn't have it. Diamonds, they don't have it. You know, uh, they, what do they have? Huh? What do they have? Uh, what? They have the sea. They, they, they have the sea. They have discipline. They, uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, the neighbor. The neighbor knows. The neighbor knows. Because Senegal looks like Cabo Verde and says, how are these people? You know, lack of natural resources. Why are they doing so well? Why are they doing so well? They keep graduating for class after class. Now they're a middle-income country. They're a middle-income country. At least they're delivering probably goods well. But that, those are the exceptions. By and large, uh, when we go to our, uh, to our beloved continent, the delivery of public goods, there's a massive deficit there, including what I think is the most important public good of them all, which is security. <coughs> the delivery of security in Africa as a public good there are very few countries that can say that we are doing this well. Very, very few countries. So the consequences of this are there for us all to see. Poverty. How can we explain in a land of just immense resources, how can we explain the poverty for millions. How can we explain that? How can we explain the violent extremism that's spreading like a wildfire? You know, a few decades ago, violent extremism was localized. And we thought it was going to be episodic that we would be doing away with violent extremism soon. It's not happening. It's not happening. We're not delivering this public good that we call security. Violent extremism is spreading, if we're going to be uh, honest. Political violence uh, is also uh, one of the consequences uh, of this uh, 
deficit in governance, deficit in the delivery of public goods. You know, we see violence, political violence, spreading across uh, the continent. We also see the weakening of sovereignty. We see the weakening of sovereignty in the sense that the ability of the state to impose itself within the territories it claims is becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. It's going the opposite direction. 60 years after independence, one expected the African state now to be solid, to be firm, to be implanted throughout the territory that it claims to be its own. That is not the case. On land, that is not the case. We see a proliferation of uh, groups, armed groups, violent groups, challenging the very sovereignty of the state, both on land and at sea. At sea, it's, it's even worse. At sea, it's even worse. Uh, the uh, non-state actors operate freely at sea. They don't even fear the state because the state is not there. The state is not present. So there's nothing to fear. The state is not there. And even worse, I see the overall fragility of societies and states. There's a certain brittleness. There's a certain brittleness that you can detect when you go to our African uh, states. So what I'm really saying is that navigating the decades ahead, if you think that these six decades have been challenging, well, when you look at the future, uh, you see many, many more uh, challenges. This is by way of bringing us to strategic leadership. Navigating uh, the decades ahead uh, will require a tremendous amount of uh, strategic uh, leadership. I believe that uh, leadership is absolutely critical. It's absolutely key to realizing all those opportunities that we listed. The opportunities are there, but they're not being realized fully. The challenges are there, but they're not being addressed. So to seize the opportunities for the betterment, for the upliftment of our peoples, and addressing the challenges uh, will require leadership. We require leadership. So let me get then to this leadership. What is leadership? You've been studying this uh, for a while. Uh, much of the conversation uh, this week uh, has been about leadership. Uh, but let me just add uh, a couple of points uh, on leadership. First of all, uh, let me remind you that leadership is about what you are. Leadership is about what you are. You find that this is a theme uh, that runs through much of the literature on leadership. Uh, it's a definitional theme that focuses on leaders' traits and attributes. Now, what are your traits? What are your attributes? Uh, and, and this is one of the oldest ways to uh, conceptualize uh, leadership. This emphasis is on identifying the characteristics that define natural 
or born leaders. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought points to leadership being about how you act. Leadership is about how you act, right? Uh, from this perspective, leadership is defined as the exercise of influence or power. The exercise of influence or power. So to identify who are the leaders, who are the leaders in this group? You look to uh, those uh, who are influencing, the influencers. To identify leaders, we need to determine who is influencing whom. Uh, this is uh, Hersey in, um, you know, wrote a, uh, a good piece on leadership uh, back in 84. He defines leadership as, quote, any attempt to influence the behavior of another individual or group. Any attempt to influence the behavior of another individual or group. That's, that's another uh, school of thought uh, on leadership. A third school of thought looks at leadership uh, being about what you do. Leadership is about what you do. Uh, this definitional thread uh, basically focuses on the roles uh, that leaders play. What is the role that you are playing within your organization? What is the role that we are playing uh, within uh, your society, and et cetera, et cetera. That's a very important uh, school of thought. A fourth uh, school of thought, and this is my last one. I could go on and on forever on the schools of thought, but that gives you, that gives you uh, the gist. That's important. Uh, I, I want to mention this because this school of thought defines leadership uh, in terms of how you work with others. It defines leadership of how you work with others. You know, again, it's not how others work for you. It's not how others work for you. It's how you work with others. Uh, the emphasis here is on collaboration. Leadership basically as a collaborative endeavor. You're not pushing people around. You're not pushing people around. That's called, called what? That's called a boss. A boss may not necessarily be a leader. Right? A collaborative, this school of thought points to collaboration. Are people actually following you because you're coercing them, you're threatening them, or because they feel part of the team. It's a common enterprise. We, we're all in this together. So we have to work together collaboratively. That's an important uh, school of thought. But when you sit down and, and, and reflect on these schools of thought on leadership, you'll find one common thread, one common thread, which is to, to elevate, to uplift individuals, institutions, societies. That's an important element of uh, leadership. If you are not uplifting anybody or anything, uh, you may have the title, but you may, you may have some work to do on that leadership thing. It's about uplifting. You find somebody 
in a certain stage, you find an organization in a certain level, by the time you leave, that individual should have achieved a higher level. That institution should have achieved a higher level. So the purpose, the end state of leadership is to guide and elevate, to guide and uplift, whether it's individuals, institutions, states, even entire societies. So that's leadership. Again, we could take a whole course on leadership, right? We could stay here for the whole semester. But I want to lay that groundwork because then I want to pivot to strategic leadership. Is as if, if leadership basic is the undergrad. Now, strategic leadership, you're graduating. Strategic leadership is not run-of-the-mill leadership. It's special. And not everybody will become a strategic leader. You have to put a tremendous amount of effort with a tremendous amount of humility to achieve the status when people look at you and say, that's a strategic leader. So strategic leadership for me in the context of Africa encompasses several very critical dimensions that ultimately are essential for achieving effective governance and development. That, that's really what we're after, isn't it? Effective governance uh, and development. Without effective governance, without development, uh, it's very difficult to achieve security. Uh, here we're here in the, in, in the security sector, and that is, that is the connection. That is one of the connections. Without effective governance and development, there's no security. There's no security. So the process for overcoming underdevelopment, the process for overcoming insecurity requires strategic leadership. Requires strategic leadership. So what exactly is strategic leadership? From my perspective, I, I want to give you uh, six key words uh, that in my, in my mind, uh, Define strategic leadership. If you're excelling in these six areas, I personally would look at you and say, well, that's a strategic leader. Let me list them and then, and then come back and, and elaborate on them just a little bit. Number one, visualize. That's the key, first key word, visualize. Second key word, assess. Third, plan. Four, mobilize. Fifth, execute. And six, adapt. And I put in, ad, adapt in brackets or perish. In, in brackets or perish. Now, you say, elaborate. No, I mean, just go over them again. Go over them again. Uh, you say, go over them again. Is that your phone that was ringing? <laughs> the, phone, the phone is ringing, and he's not paying attention. You know, you know if, you were, if I were to give him a grade right now, I think, it, you know. Anyway, let's do it again. You know, it, it is my boss because he's sitting there. Right? I have to do it again. So number one, visualize. Number two, assess. Number three, plan. Number four, mobilize. 
Number five, execute. And six, adapt, put in, in brackets, or perish, <laughs> right? Or perish. Now, you know, let's, let's go uh, through them in some, uh, in some detail. You know, the first one. Strategic leaders know where they're going. Hmm? Strategic leaders know where they're going. You need to know where you are going. If you're leading, as, if you're leading people, if you're leading organizations, you may be, be, be in, leading con whole entire countries. You need to know where you are going. Where are you taking these people? Where are you taking this country? You need to know where you're going. Hmm? You need to know where you're going. Where is point B? You need to visualize clearly. To be, when I come to you and say, where are you going? You have to explain to me, Prof, I'm going to point B. And point B looks like this. You know, the contours, the terrain, uh, the, the, the makeup of the people, everything, you need to visualize it. Especially if you want to transform a society. What does the good society look like to you? I'm, I'm taking this country from point A to point B, point B being the good society. What does the good society look like if you visualize it? Or have you just borrowed the, 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 uh, the blueprint from somebody else? You come to the United States, you know, you cut and paste something, you go back and say, okay, I know where we're going. You don't. <laughs> you have no idea. So you need to know where you're going. Focus forward. You know, as Africans, <laughs> as Africans, we like to look back too much. History, our ancestors, this, it, blah, 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 the kingdoms of this, and so on and so forth. That's in the past. That's in the past. You need to look forward. You know, I used, I used to tell my, my, uh, uh, my cadets in California when I teach course on strategy, I, I would tell them that there's a reason why, you know, uh, the, um, the designers, when they, when they make a car, right, you know, the windshield tends to be big. You know, but the rear view mirror tends to be very tiny. There's a, reason, there's a reason for that. Because they don't want you to pay attention to the rear view mirror. They want you to pay attention forward, right? If you're driving, paying attention to your rear view mirror, what's going to happen? Accident, every mile you have an accident. That's why I don't like to drive in Africa. I just, I don't like to. So focus forward, focus forward and focus on the big picture. Focus on the big, some, some uh, I don't want to even call them leaders. Some bosses, they like to focus on the minutia. You know, how many pencils, you know, uh, you know, how many bricks and so on and so forth. No, that's not your job. Don't focus on the bricks, focus on the whole cities. You know, focus on the whole country. That's what you're trying to build. You're not just building a house. You're not just building a street. Focus on the big picture. So that's visualize. The second one is assess. Assess. You know, Many times we take for granted that we know who we are. Who we are as an organization, as, an, uh, as, a, as a country. 
as a society. A strategic leader is careful to fully understand who we are and what we are. You know, first, you need to know yourself, isn't it? First, you need to know yourself. You know, if you know yourself, is basically uh, half, half, uh, half of the journey. It's very important. You assess your strengths and weaknesses. What can you do? What are some of the things that you simply cannot do, even if you dream about it? So you need to assess. What are your capabilities? Who, who do you have on your team? Who can you count on? You need to be able to assess, and you need to be able to assess constantly. It may be boring, but trust me, it's absolutely critical. Assessment also means understanding where you stand. Understand the terrain where you stand. Understand your strategic environment is very important. You cannot just start walking without understanding the neighborhood, understanding the terrain. You know, and that's one of the mistakes, one of the key strategic mistakes African states, African leaders made at independence. They just started walking. You know, they just started walking. You know, what is the context? How do you navigate the Cold War? Well, you know, I, I just make an alliance here, I make an alliance there, you know, I, I'll be okay. You know, how do you navigate a very complex system on the economic side where you don't determine the prices of your goods, of your resources? You're selling oil. You say, well, I'm rich because I got diamonds. But who determines the price of diamonds and why? Right? You need to understand where you stand, the strategic terrain. If you don't understand the strategic terrain, my friend, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. Uh, where are your capabilities uh, to shape your strategic environment? The third one is plan. Plan. Well, so you have a vision, right? Good, you visualize the end state, perfect. Now, how do you transform that vision into reality? How do you do that? Again, go back to where I started. The promise of independence, that was a vision. The promise of independence that was a vision. I've been studying uh, African politics and economics and society for decades. Study all the great African leaders. Kruma, Senghor, Cabral, you go on and on and on. Sekuture, you know, you go on and on. We had many visionaries. Nyerere, Kaunda, so many, so many. If any of their dreams become a reality, any, zero. Zero. Are you going to read uh, their manifests? You know, uh, when, when we kick the uh, colonialists out, this is what we're going to do. Boom. Uh, the good society. A good society doesn't exist in Africa. Where does it exist? It's this issue of transforming vision into reality. You have a vision, good. That's a good start. How do you transform it into reality? Basic things like direction. What direction are you going to take? If north is up there, don't go this way, right? 
is going to take you a long time to get to north. Eventually, you're going to get there, but it's going to take a very long time. It just basic sense, okay, this is the direction, number one. Number two, the sequencing. What's step number one? What's step number two, et cetera? This business of sometimes you take step number five, and then you take step number 14, and then you come back to step number two, and so on. It takes a long time to materialize anything. You'll get there eventually, but it takes a long time. If you have a better sense of direction and sequencing, then uh, you have uh, a much better chance. As it pertains to plan, the issue of priorities, very important. Why are your priorities? Are your priorities political? Are your priorities developmental? Are your priorities security? What are your priorities? What are your priorities? Because if you don't have priorities, then you will, chances are that you will misallocate the few resources that you have, and chances are that you're not going to achieve your strategic objectives. Planning also implies choosing the most appropriate path. There are many paths out there open to you. There are many. But what is the most appropriate path? What is the one that you say, okay, I'm going to take this path. I'm going to take this path, and I will be consistent in the pursuit of my objectives, and it's going to get me to that end state, whether security or development or whatever. Now, there are other countries that have done it. And the results are there for everybody uh, to see. On planning, I must also say that, you know, you have to be careful not to leave things to chance. Don't just leave things to chance. Don't say, okay, hey, I'm Nigeria, right? Because I'm Nigeria, good things will happen to me. No. Don't leave things to chance. Just because you have oil, uh, yeah, I can relax now. My fu future is guaranteed. Don't leave things to chance. The other thing also, don't trust your future in the hands of others. You know, that planning means that, okay, you, you take responsibility for your own future. You take responsibility for your own future. You say, look, this is where I want to be. And I, not my friends in America, not my friends in Europe, not my friends, now China is everybody's friend, right? But it's okay. But don't entrust your future in their hands. It's your future. It's not mine. It's your future. So that's plan. Mobilize. I I'm almost done. <laughs> Mobilize. It's about resources. My friends, you have to mobilize resources. Just because the resources are there, this you could be sitting on a pile of gold. Hmm? But you still need to mobilize those resources. You may be, all of our African countries, the human resources are there. But how many countries are mobilizing the youth? How many, how many countries are mobilizing the youth and directioning, or directing the youth in a certain path to achieve what the country needs? We are now mobilizing resources. In fact, we are mismanaging the resources. We are mismanaging the resources. At the human resource level, we are exporting. Everybody who's bright, it gets exported. Europe, 
The, Amer the United States, this is a beautiful country. You export anybody to the United States, and this, this country will applaud. They say, okay, bring him over here. We'll put him to good use. All right? You know, you kick anybody out of Africa, you land here, you're good. All right? Uh, you're exporting everything, resources. You're even exporting just pure cash. Exporting everything, but you, know, you need to you need to retain some of it, mobilize it, and use it well. Use allocate those resources well, allocate them efficiently, so that those resources can produce, can help you produce those public goods that we so desperately need. Uh, in, in, in a way that um, uh, achieves development and achieves security. And, and, and fifth, execute. Uh, yeah, you know, if, if, uh, if you can put together a nice strategy and you let it sit there, you know, and you, 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 know, you, you, show the, you show it to everybody, you're very proud of your strategy. Look, I have, I have a national security strategy. Look, I have, I have a maritime strategy. You know, I have, you know, uh, you have all sorts of strategies. You know, over the last 20 years, it's like uh, the 2020 plans, right? It's the, at, the, at the beginning of the, 20, uh, the 21st century, every country in Africa had a vision something. First was Vision 2020, <laughs> because people thought that 20 years was good enough. Now is Vision 2063, when we're all dead, <laughs> right? Right? Now, so visions are there. The visions are many. Every single country plus the continent has one. Now, how many? Are, have been executed. I mean, what? Well, there you go. <laughs> Execute. You have to do it. You know, the a, a strategic leader who does everything, but at the end of the day, she does not execute the strategy. Yeah, uh, uh, she's not called a strategic leader, isn't it? Uh, and you have to, for you, for you to, uh, to execute, first of all, for me, uh, the, the secret is in the people. Who, who do you have working with you? Who do you have working with you? Find good people. Find humble people. Find people that can give their very best um, and, uh, and, and just gonna motivate them, motivate them to accomplish their very best. You know, if you can do that, you know, chances are that uh, you are okay. But don't just motivate people, also hold them accountable. Accountability is key. You want to be, if you want to be a strategic leader, you should be able to motivate your people and hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. First mistake is a learning opportunity. First mistake, you have to be very firm. I mean, the second mistake, did I say first? The second mistake, you have to be very, very firm. Because you need to instill a culture of excellence in the organization. You have to instill a culture of excellence. You can't be a strategic leader and tolerate lax behavior, lax performance. You're not a strategic leader. You have to be firm. First mistake, yes, is a learning opportunity. And you have to sit down with that person humbly and explain where that person went wrong. Second mistake, you have to you know, you have to be harsh. 
because you have to tell everybody that you do not tolerate incompetence. You don't tolerate inefficiencies, and so on and so forth, et cetera. If you need to let somebody go, let somebody go. What's the problem? <laughs> Just let them go. Find somebody who can execute. Uh, and finally, you need to adapt. If, if you don't adapt, uh, you will perish. You will stay behind. You know, the, the world doesn't wait for anybody. You know, you can't tell the world, okay, stop. Because, hey, I'm Africa. I need to get ready. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. The world will say goodbye to you. And you say, hey, what's wrong with these people? I'm an African. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You'll stay behind. You have to adapt. And you have to adapt at all levels. Even yourself. At an individual, personal level, you have to adapt. You have to keep up with the times. It goes all the way, all the way. You have to adapt. Or otherwise, you're going to be left behind. So how do we attain strategic leadership skills. You know, I could just hear you people asking, okay, how do we do that? Two things. For me, two things. One is training. The other one is practice. First, the training. You know, training is really about the acquisition of uh, knowledge. The acquisition of, you, ha you have to endeavor to acquire knowledge. You have to endeavor to acquire skills. And I would say, you have to endeavor to acquire wisdom. Because leadership requires wisdom. Leadership requires wisdom. So you have to constantly train yourself. Don't ever believe that now you're already a master. No. Be forever a student. That's the ticket. Learn. Study. Uh, learn from others. Even from their mistakes, learn. Learn. The acquisition of training. E ESSL. This is, this is uh, uh, all bias aside, uh, this is a good example of training. Secondly, you have to practice. You have to practice. Now, you have, you have acquired all that, all those, all that knowledge. You have, you have acquired all those skills. You have acquired wisdom. Now, you have to, you have to give you have to give to, 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 you have to, you have to serve. You have to give. You have to apply. Uh, so when, when, when you get back home uh, after uh, ESSL, now I know that you have a little bit of training. You have a few skills. I don't know about the wisdom, but I'm, I hope, yeah. <laughs> I hope you've acquired some wisdom. <laughs> A little bit here, a little bit there. Go back and apply. Put it into practice. Transform your organizations. Transform your countries. Transform the continent. Thank you very much.